Please welcome the co-founders of Headspace, Andy Putacum and Rich Pearson. Uh, welcome to SC. Have you guys been here before? I haven't. Rich, I Rich has been here for a few times, yeah. Well, welcome to, and welcome back. As I mentioned, today, uh, our class is more about mindset, so Headspace mm. is the perfect app and, uh, and uh, tool that this class is yearning for. And again, uh, we have a sister class with uh, Dr. Fox's uh, uh, Science of High Performance class that it just fits in perfectly. So some of the, a lot of the students are in both classes. Okay. So tonight, I, I want to sort of do two things. Um, uh, you know, a background of your, your life stories, uh, get into Headspace, how it happened, that story. And then, and then if you feel inclined, maybe a, a mindfulness or a meditation exercise, uh, sort of three parts. And then, then we'll open up to questions. Sure. And uh, then we'll all do a little dance. No, and then uh, we'll come back with a question. So, so because this is about um, uh, mindfulness and meditation, we want to minimize the distractions. And so close your laptops. If you don't need them to take notes, if you're not taking notes for the class, close your laptops. Calm, confident, focused, here, present. It's a great moment to be here, right? This is just for us, right? This is for This you. little prep talk. Yeah. It's not for these guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I want you here too as well. Yeah, we'll be here. <laughs> well, let's, let's start with, for those who aren't familiar with uh, mindfulness and meditation, wh what is it and why should we believe in it? Sure. Um, so the first thing I'd say is not a matter of belief. You know, so the traditionally meditation and mindfulness were taught in such a way that, you know, there's no belief required, actually. That here's, a, here's a technique. Go away. Try it. If it makes a difference, then you have some confidence. And you have confidence born from experience, not from the words that somebody else is going to speak. So I, I would kind of emphasize that. Kind of don't take my word for it or Rich's. Um, go away. Try the techniques for yourself and kind of see if it makes a difference. I think um, it's worth just differentiating mindfulness and meditation. They get used interchangeably a lot, especially in the, in the media. They're really kind of different things. So, so mindfulness is the ability to be present. So undistracted and with an open mind. So if you think about the times in, in your life when you might experience that, maybe there was a time, I don't know, you were watching a, a sunset um, maybe you're listening to some music, maybe you're with a friend, but that time where all the thoughts and distractions just kind of melted away and you felt fully kind of present in the moment. The challenge for most of us is that those moments are quite infrequent and they tend to just arise and when they do arise, we love them, they wish they'd last longer, but they kind of don't stay around for too long. So we need a, an environment in which we can learn the skill of mindfulness and that's all meditation is. So you're, you're becoming familiar with what it means to be mindful, undistracted, with an open mind. So meditation, we take ourselves away for five minutes, ten minutes, for some people an hour, and, you kind of, and, we, and we learn the skill of mindfulness, and we, it's then about applying that back into everyday life. So how many of you regularly feel stressed? How many of you are, have anxiety because you have anxiety? Over your anxiety. All right. That's, you're in the right place. Yeah. So, so what are the, be you know, before we're going to dive into your backgrounds, what are the benefits of, of practicing mindfulness in terms of the real tangible benefits for your life? Proven. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it is worth um, separating out kind of anecdotal and scientifically kind of proven. There's, there's well over 5,000 published papers now, probably about 3,000 or so that are, are peer reviewed and respected sort of medical journals. Um, and it's, it's broad, so everything from uh, insomnia, so sleeping better, to reducing um, blood pressure, um, to reducing anxiety, to decreasing the incidence of depression, or in particular the relapse of depression, um, reducing stress. Um, to, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's so, so broad. The, the scope of it, it's become such a kind of hot sort of topic in neuroscience. Um, that we've seen studies around, uh, my, my personal favorites uh, are outside of the health realm, they're more in compassion. So we're working with the, um, the National Health Service in the UK, um, looking at um, uh, sort of compassion fatigue. So doctors and nurses who are working in really stressful environments who often burn out very quickly, um, and actually kind of looking to see how mindfulness can be used in, as an intervention so that people can continue being compassionate and caring in their work, but not burning out in the process. So it's also, in addition to the science, there's anecdotal evidence about how it improves your relationships and your health. And I mean, there's not just anecdotal, but there's, there's tons. And, and I think, you know, we can dig deeper into it later on. But if you are interested, if you just go to the Headspace website, we've got a whole 
sort of part of the website which is dedicated to, to the science and you can dig in not only to where it's relevant to you but also you can go into the paper and have a look kind of where it came from so okay. yeah well, let's uh, let's sort of just go back a little bit in terms of your lives maybe a little bit more than a little bit uh, rich where, where did you grow up where were you born size of family um, so I was born in a place called Kent which is just south of London uh, in one of the home counties uh, I was brought up in I've got one sister so quite a small family I was brought up in the middle of the country with no houses around me for about 10 miles um, and then I went to boarding school when I was 13 so I was surrounded by a few more people then but up until that point it had been it had been me and the sheep and the cows <laughs> and uh, what did your parents do for work they're both entrepreneurs actually um, my mum has had the same ladies boutique for like 27 years and my dad has had the same business that he's had since he was 17 years coming up for almost 50 years he's had he's had the same business so I was brought up with two long-term same business it's kind of incredible they're still they're still going today that's yeah. a, that is incredible <laughs> that's a long run yeah. did you have any uh you know early experiences with entrepreneurship or did you would you wait till you're sort of out well. of school <laughs> I would say that I, I just I say that I I try I think Andy was the same as well I think <laughs> I, I tried a lot of things before Headspace I had about eight or nine different businesses when I met Andy I had about eight or nine different yeah. business ideas that I was trying to I always had something cooking that was trying to get off the ground and everyone kind of saying what a stupid idea it was for a long long time ever since I can remember really since I was 13, 14, where it was selling tickets for nightclubs or trying to put on parties or anything. Yeah. You always see that sort of common thread in a lot of people that just people hustle early or understand money yeah. early. And once you sort of get that taste for it, um, and if your family encourages it or, or just family uh, situation necessitates um, it, you just start, you're sort of set in that mindset. What about you? Where'd you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in the, the southwest of England, so sort of Bristol, Bath area so Bristol. how far from like Bournemouth and Poole a little bit further north a little bit further west all right north. um but it's, it's kind of farming territory it's the equivalent I guess of the midwest out here or something um yeah so I, I grew up there with um with a mum who was she's like a hippie at heart and um so it's very conventional traditional family I had a slightly older sister um but my mum was yeah, she kind of had this this streak of just she's very progressive she was working in stress management training so it was like sort of 35 years ago um so it's maybe no coincidence i ended up taking the route that i that i did in the end but, you know, as, as steve jobs said at stanford you know you, you can't align the dots looking forward but you can want yeah. look at them looking back and yours is so amazing. interesting to look yeah, back it's on amazing it's um, i want to talk about your unique experience before this and then we'll circle around to how you guys met and sort of how you came together so uh, 1992, I think in, in your life you, you experienced some hardship. Can you tell us what happened in your life? Sure, yeah. I, um, I was, um, probably like most of you, um, I, was, uh, I was a student and, um, you know, we'd gone out drinking one night and a, a drunk driver crashed into a group of us, killed a couple of, a couple of friends and, and injured, you know, probably put about 12 in intensive care. Um, so a like really heavy kind of situation. and. I think everybody went away from, from that night, kind of dealing with it in, in different ways, you know, and some people drank a lot and other people kind of went and had therapy and it wasn't really the kind of, you know, I say they went and had therapy, it wasn't really a time or a place in the UK where therapy was even a, a thing, you know. So therapy at that stage was just finding someone that you could kind of talk to. Um, my way of coping with it was to, to go overseas as quickly as possible. Um, I just traveled and I, I came over here actually to, to America. I worked for a little bit. I went and did a ski season in France, uh, working in a bar. Went to Ibiza um, for a, a summer season and did some building work. And as much as I kind of tried to travel around the world, trying to sort of get away from uh, those really difficult feelings inside of myself, um, they, they, my mind just sort of followed me wherever I went. Um, not surprisingly. So I, I found myself in a situation and the family situation. So I, just after that accident had happened, my, my stepsister was run over and killed as well in a, like three months later. So the family situation was quite intense as well. So I didn't really kind of feel like I had a, a sort of a, a home there. And so I found myself in a situation thinking, okay, well, I'm going to study because that's what everybody does. And that's what all my friends have done. I was, I was three years behind, but I could see they were having quite good fun at university. And I thought, yeah, that would be, that would be good. 
So I went to university. And just to be clear, I'm, I'm not recommending that you do what I did, because um, I'm about to tell you how I left university halfway through. Um, but I went to study sports science, and I was about a year, year and a half in. And I had an overwhelming feeling that although it was very satisfying, it was very interesting, it wasn't particularly kind of fulfilling. It wasn't like in, in a deep sense, you know. It, didn't give, it wasn't answering the questions that I was interested in in life, and it wasn't giving me a, a sense of peace of mind or a real kind of purpose and direction in life. So I, um, yeah, I, I quit university, and um, I went and became a, a Buddhist monk in, in the Himalayas instead. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's so many questions on this. So, you, you, where did you go to Nepal? Um, I started off in um, northern India. So, most of, um, again, apologies to those of you who know this stuff, but most of the, um, so most of the good Tibetan monasteries are actually in northern India or Nepal, um, just because of the, the situation um, in, in Tibet. So, a lot of the teachers kind of came over um, to, to India in the 50s, 60s. So I started off there. I actually ended up doing five years in the, the Burmese tradition um, and then five years in the Tibetan tradition. So I went back, went to Burma and then went back to India where I ordained in the, in the Tibetan tradition um, and then did five years in the, the Tibetan. I, I, uh, I was just in Myanmar recently oh, okay. and, uh, and visited a couple of monasteries. I'm, yeah. what, what city were you in? Were you in uh, Yangon? I was just outside Yangon, about three, three hours outside Yangon. Yeah. So share with the class what that lifestyle entails and requires. So look, um, <laughs> it, it is, um, it's, an, it's an acquired taste, and um, you kind of have to go there to kind of really feel it. I don't think anything I can say will really um, kind of give you that, that feeling. Um, when you're in, in retreat, so I'll just give you kind of a, t a little taste of the Burmese, a little taste of the Tibetan, and you can... Um, in the Burmese monastery, um, it's, quite, it's quite strict, you know. Um, there's not a lot of um, joking around, um, which I found quite difficult because I like joking around. And, um, and it's silent, so any joking around would have had to have been sort of sh through charades anyway. And um, <laughs> so I was there for, for a long time. And you, so it's nine hours of um, sitting practice a day, nine hours of walking practice a day. So you're in a, a shrine room, kind of like a big room. And um, you have a, a seat at the end of the, the room with a, a little, it's like a little mosquito net. You pull the, every time you sit down on the, on the hour, you pull the string and the mosquito net kind of drops down. And then the gong goes at the end of the hour and you pull it back up. And then you do an hour of walking meditation just backwards and forwards. So you do nine hours of each every day. Um, you have breakfast at five and lunch at 11. Um, and then you don't eat after midday as a, as a monk. Where do your meals come from? Uh, the local community provide them, so they, they, bring, in, they bring in food and uh, they support the community and in return the, the monastery support the local community with, um, sort of with teachings. Um, and then you go to bed. Uh, as a monk or a nun, you, um, and it is nuns as well um, in, in these monasteries, um, you're separated, um, but you sleep pretty much on the floor and you have about three, three, four hours a night, sort of three, three, four hours sleep a night. Um, and then the Tibetan ones are a little different. So the Tibetan ones are a lot more, this is my experience, a lot more fun. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a riot in there, you know? It was, um, so uh, you do four, four blocks of meditation a day. They're three or four hours each, so it's slightly kind of different. Um, but it's not all in, silent, in silence, so you get to kind of chat a little bit between the sessions. Um, and there's just, I don't know, for me, there was a much greater emphasis on, on compassion, on kind of playfulness. I know that sounds kind of, you know, with that schedule, it doesn't sound very playful. Um, but when you're looking at meditation and trying to bring a spirit of playfulness and curiosity and interest into it, like, that's really important to have a, an environment that supports that. And what did you have to give up in terms of being there? I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm not making a joke of this. Sure. No, because, because when you study... <laughs> neuroscience, yeah. you study biology, you know, first you have to recognize that we're, humans are an animal, yeah. and it's very difficult to turn off, you know, evolutionary systems, so yeah. how do you do that? You see, I mean, you give up, you give up worldly life as they, uh, that's how it's kind of translated, so you, you give away everything you have, so you, give, you have to give away all your worldly possessions before you go in there. My mom was a bit sneaky. Um, she, she took all my photos and things like that and packed them away in the attic. So when I went back home to give everything away, 
there were things missing, which have since reappeared. Um, but you gave everything, you know, you give money away, and then obviously you become celibate as a, as a monk. Um, so you give up uh, relationships um, in that sense. For which, how long? Which is, your, which is a 22-year-old guy was, was interesting, you know. <laughs> Let's put it like that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you sort of make light but, of it, but you were doing this for t 10 years. Yeah, but I think the, um, I actually, I, I, not to give too much information, um, but I did have a break between being a Burmese monk and a Tibetan monk, but it was brief. <laughs> <laughs> so it's five years, not 10 years. But, um, <laughs> but I, think, I think it's really um, uh, <laughs> true. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing. I think most people, like most of us kind of think that we, every thought that arises in our, in our mind, we have to go with the thought. Or, to, or any feeling that arises in the body, we have to go with, with the feeling. And because of that, we're kind of a, almost a slave to the, to the mind, you know. So we just, we feel like the mind has control over us or our body has control over us. And what you find by sitting and watching the, the mind and watching the thoughts is that actually it's possible to get to a point where these feelings and thoughts arise and you're able to see them, witness them clearly and let them go. And as a result of that, the mind is freedom because you no longer feel like a slave to the mind. So although it sounds like a, you know, quite a challenging kind of thing, it's actually an incredibly liberating thing because over, over time there's a, there's a sense of kind of freedom that comes with that. But you can only find that by sitting down with it. There's no other way. You can't, you can't do it from reading a book. Yeah. No, it, <laughs> and uh, you know, that long of a stretch uh, it sort of explains how you become an expert in this and it lines up. But so you, how do you wrap up that part of your life when, when you, uh, uh, I guess you discontinue being a monk? Yeah. Uh, what do you do next? And tell us what your next degree is in. <laughs> um, so my next degree was in, in circus arts. Um, so let me just give some context around this because I appreciate it sounds um, a fairly sort of diverse um, resume, but um, so I competed in gymnastics until the age of 22 when I went away to become a monk So for 10 years, I then kind of did no exercise. So at the end of my time as a monk um, I was one I was really keen to get back into my body and to do something physical uh, The monastery had sent me to Moscow in Russia um, where I was teaching uh, meditation I met a guy who was doing a, a degree at Moscow State Circus and he said well look You know if you're not a monk anymore, maybe you want to come along and I started going along and it was really fun and they were like, you can do a degree in this back in London, you know. And at the time, I'd given everything, as I say, away as a monk and I had no idea how I was going to do what, you know, is now this, you know. And um, so I was trying to think, okay, how am I going to go back to, how am I going to go back to England? How am I going to afford it? I have no money. And as a, I was an old student. I was like 32 at the time, I think. And so in, in the UK, if you're an older student, the government are really supportive. So they not only give you money for education, they give you money for your accommodation, like the whole thing. So I moved back to London and I did a, a degree in circus arts. And whilst I was doing that, I wrote up the, the content for, well, which we now, now use in Headspace. And Rich, tell us about your early career and sort of where that took you. Uh, you started, at, I don't know if you started in advertising, but I know you spent a considerable time in advertising. Yeah, no, I, I, my whole, uh, it's advertising's fault that this has happened. Um, we, I started on a graduate training scheme straight out of university and joined McCann Erickson. And I was there for about a year and a half. And then I got headhunted by an agency called BBH. I was basically there for the whole balance of, of my career. And I got, I got promoted pretty young with not a lot of um, help and not a lot of guidance or kind of coaching. I just kept, kind of kept getting dropped into bigger and bigger roles. And I think that was part of that was, I don't think Headspace could have happened if that, mm. that hadn't happened, not just because of the fact I burnt out, but I think it, it taught, it was a kind of sink or swim culture. And I kept kind of, prove myself but I think because I didn't have any experience or training with it I had no idea how to kind of manage my energy or how to actually kind of approach it in a in a professional way and so I found myself at 20 was 26 yeah 26 okay. and and just kind of had a bit of a breakdown and so I kind of left and I didn't know what I was going to do and my I was getting acupuncture at the time for my stress 
my acupuncturist said, have you ever thought about being an acupuncturist? And I was like, I've never thought about being an acupuncturist. <laughs> and he said, well, I've got a course starting in two weeks. Do you want to do it? So I said, yeah, sure. So I did it. So I was, I was doing that. And I, I was doing that three days a week. And I was freelancing. And I did, never thought I was going to be an acupuncturist. Like, deep down, I never thought I was going to be an acupuncturist. But it was, a, it, was a, it was a chance for me. Like, hindsight's no sight. You know, you're thinking about the dots. But it mm. gave me the space to explore all the business ideas that I had and didn't have time to kind of do. So I was kind of doing that in my spare time. And then I was freelancing. And that's when I met Andy, because I was freelancing for one of Andy's clients. He had a clinic in London. And so one of his clients said, have you, um, I've, I've been getting meditation lessons off this monk. <laughs> and I was like, really? He was like, yeah, he's been teaching me meditation. He said, I actually need some help, like marketing his clinic. Would you go and meet him? And so I was kind of intrigued. And yeah, and then so we met, and yeah, that was that was the start of it. That was how that's kind of how it all. It was very, it was very organic. It was very natural, and we we did a kind of skill swap to start with. I came up with some ideas for the clinic, and he taught me meditation. And at the time, I think it's also worth saying that you know my my breakdown was kind of pretty <laughs> intense, and I couldn't. Um, it was really difficult for me to be in public. My anxiety levels were really, really... I found it really, really difficult to just be in the world. Mm. And uh, it, it just helped. Like, from the very first session, it wasn't like... It, I was like, oh, my God, I'm cured of my anxiety. But I thought, there's something in this. Like, there's something... There was, a, like, a, a glimmer that I thought, wow, there's something really, really, really interesting and... And I'd never met anyone like Andy. Like that was, that was kind of, so it was a really, it was an unusual kind of meeting. And we started off where Andy was my meditation teacher, then he became my friend, mm -hmm. and then we became business partners. So it's, a, yeah. it's an unusual kind of relationship that we have, which I think is why Headspace is what it is today. What know? was, I, I've read, what was the first like poignant question he asked you? It was, I remember, he said, how much of your life do you think you spent in the present moment? Say that again yeah. so they can hear that. How much of your life do you think you spent in the present moment? No one, does that, does that? Yeah, I, I, I don't remember, yeah, but I yeah, remember. I, <laughs> um, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's a good question, like just to ask yourself from time to time, you know, like how, how much time really do you spend in the present moment? I don't know if anyone saw, I don't want to interrupt your no, story, I don't know if anyone saw that uh, there was a study, um, it was probably like five, six years ago now from, from Harvard, where um, it, I think they, they, they discovered that almost 50% of our, our life is spent in mind wandering, you know. So 47% of our life typically is spent mind wandering, so distracted. And on the one hand, like, that's kind of frightening enough to think that we don't live for that long anyway and to miss half of our life because we're lost in thought is kind of tragic. But more than that, the conclusion of the study found that people who simply allow their mind to wander are that much more likely to be unhappy. So, and there was a direct correlation between mind wandering and unhappiness. So, I think there's, th there's something interesting there to, to explore for all of us. If you throw in sleep, it's more than 50% too. Sure. Those are your waking hours. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not liking that percentage at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, Rich, share with us sort of the, you know, you, you said the relationship evolved. Tell us about how the relationship, before, before Headspace, yeah. what, as you started uh, spending more time uh, with Andy and maybe adopting some of these practices, how did it impact your life? Yeah, well, I think one no one had ever asked me a question in the ad world. Not many people say, <laughs> "How much of your time have you spent in the present moment?" It wasn't the kind of conversations I was I was having, and it it did kind of fl something kind of clicked in me. It kind of floored me that that question, and I think it started a for me a process of kind of inquiry and curiosity that kind of hasn't really stopped. I would say. Mm. So that, that was the first thing. And then I think the biggest thing that I noticed early on was the separation between that my emotions and my thoughts weren't necessarily real. And that for me was a huge, like a huge moment of understanding that my anxiety is something that kind of changes and it isn't fixed. Mm -hmm. When Andy kind of explained that to me and like your thoughts, they kind of change and they're constantly kind of moving and it's only when we hold on to the, like the they for me they were they were earth earth shattering kind of points of view that changed my whole perspective on life and I think as a result it changed my relationship with myself 
And then more importantly, it changed my relationship with every, every single person around me. I think that, and my relationship to the, to the world and the way that I was living and the way that I was thinking. And it just, it made me question everything and still kind of makes me question everything. But I think that that is, uh, mm. that was the thing that got me hooked into it and became quite addictive. And I've, I haven't, I've never missed a session since that, that first. Pretty committed. That first day. When you say haven't missed a session, what do you mean by that? I've never ever not meditated every single day since I got taught by Andy. <laughs> eight, eight, nine years ago, something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a pretty powerful testimonial to, uh, to the power of the practice and your influence. It's, you know, if, and the, the purpose of this class and Glenn's class is, is you know, there are some things that they're going to have to learn and touch the stove and burn their hands you know, and have the experience that you have of just having a life. But if, if you could cut out some of that anxiety, yeah the yeah. decades of anxiety that their parents had, that I've yeah. had, and sort of learned this earlier, yeah. you can have a better I, life. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really easy, right, to kind of look back and to, to think like that. And, you know, I was, we were chatting the other day, I was, I was lucky, I'd, so we got introduced, I got introduced to meditation by my mom when I was about 11, you know, but it was never really became like a serious kind of practice. But when, when I look back now, we're doing a lot of work with Headspace for Kids in schools and with young, and. And learning those, you know, you think of the, you look back at the, the skills that you learn at school, and sure, there's some useful ones there, but, like, <laughs> really? Like, I mean, happiness should, like, a happy life should probably be really high priority in our society, you know? And I'm not suggesting that quadratic equations are less important, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> um, I just, I, you know, I, I think if we can, it does, doesn't matter. Like, really, the earlier you can learn it, the better. Um, and even if you didn't learn it as a, as a young child, like, to learn it now, I don't know how old you guys are, but um, I guess it's a similar age to when I went off to, to become a monk, and, and I just cannot, you know, whether you use Headspace or you use something else or you find your own kind of way, I cannot recommend enough, like, the, the benefits of pausing on a daily basis just to, just to let go of all the the inner chatter in the mind and to find a place of sort of calm and clarity. And did you find that by sort of calming your mind and having a mindfulness or meditation practice that, um, that your self-talk improved, that your anxiety improved, that your, even your, your self-image and self-esteem improved? Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult when you, because you kind of see yourself how you are now and it's difficult sometimes to look, to look back on it. But I would say that it's not like anxiety disappears. Like I think that's I think that's the big myth that you think oh I'm gonna I'm gonna master these emotions and I'm never gonna have them again, and my experience has been the complete opposite of that, which is that you just become more aware of them and that you you go into them quicker, as in you notice when you go into them sooner mm -hmm. and you can come out of them quicker. So it's not that you don't you, it's not that you stop experiencing them, mm -hmm. but you don't get stuck in them. And I used to have months where I would be in a in a, like an anxiety funk where I just, it never got any better. It was just mm. a constant hamster wheel of feeling like that, no matter what happened. And there'd be brief distractions, but on the whole, I, I never felt like it was just mastering me. And so now I kind of feel I just have a bit more, I have different tools to be able to deal with those things when they come up. So that, and it's subtle, but for me, that's been the, the big thing. I never mm. feel like I've mastered them. Well, the, the one thing about emotions is that they will change. And it's just whether you observe them and are aware of them as opposed to just focus and focus. You know, the, the, almost any emotion begets more of that same emotion, yeah. whether it's worry or yeah. self-doubt or any of those things. And so it is being able to sort of pull back, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a student in this. I'm not by no means an expert, so I'm trying to figure it out myself. Um, so uh, continue with Rich. So what's the first business? You guys, you guys built an events business. Talk it about is. that first. Well, the, the first idea was, you know, Andy had always had a, a vision to make this kind of bigger than it was. And the very first meeting that we had, which was in a sushi bar in London, was I thought that he should put this on an app. And, um, and he didn't think that it would work on an app. True story. Yeah. Um, but to be fair, you had a very good reason. Like, we both agreed that it was actually probably not the right, yeah. the right route to take. I think what, well, one apps had come out probably about six months before then. I had no idea what they were. Um, I didn't really know what a mobile phone was. Um, 
and I was a little bit behind the curve with that stuff. But also this tradition had been passed down from kind of person to person and always in person. So it was, it was kind of hard to imagine how you could put something on a device and just kind of put it out there and think that it, it would work. Um, and Rich kind of had the, the foresight. Uh, but also the patience to stick with me when I said, no, that's not going to work. Well, it is the, it's the purist yeah. Yeah. and the marketer. Yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's a nice blend of that. And, and you know, it, it's ironic, we can talk about this now or later, that you know, the very thing that the app is helping you with, which is to uh, pull back and not be distracted by the one thing that distracts <laughs> you more than anything, is it's the one the thing that you're using. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a, sort of an irony in that, but d tell us why, well, we're talking about your events yeah. business, but yeah. um, tell us why that has to be the way. You Which, know, the, 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 why, why the irony or the, parado uh, the paradox of yeah. having a device that you're supposed to be pulling away from is the one thing that's instructing you. But it's the thing that everyone, you might as well go to where people are and that's where they're spending the time. And if mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that the rules have been written on how we should use technology yet. I don't think any of us really understand how we can use it in a way that kind of feels good. So I still think we're working it out. We're, we're just at the start mm -hmm. of the pendulum. We haven't had these powerful computers in our pockets for long enough to really under, understand how to use them in a, in a smart way. And so I think there's a massive opportunity for smart people like yourselves to think about application services that live on these devices that can genuinely help people live in a more thoughtful way. And I, I just think we're right at the tip of what mm. that can be. Headspace is one version of that, but I think it would be great if we were trying to make things um, that had real impact on people's lives versus yeah. trying to get people addicted to engagement, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that's ever gonna... The problem is we're so in addicted to the way that these products have been built <laughs> that that's why we're so distracted. Mm. You know, I was with someone uh, yesterday up in San Fran saying, her kids, like, they cannot watch a feature-length film. They cannot watch anything over an hour long. Like, seven minutes in and they're off. Yeah. It's like they're, they're bored, they're out. It's kind of that rewiring, I think, is, is pretty scary, personally. You're glad that you didn't have that rewired while you were being a monk. You know, you didn't have that same type of... I mean, yeah. their brains are different than our brains, and I'm sure the next generation's <laughs> brains will be different, too. Uh, so it's a struggle. But I guess you... you, you you hit on the thing of the events business mm. that that this solved or this proposes to solve which is scale you can't scale an events business very easily without sort of adding more people yeah. and you know yeah. infrastructure so uh did, did you sort of come up with the tech platform and you know the concept meets as the tech platform what was your mm. what was your shorthand pitch for for headspace was there something out there already that you thought this is like that no there really wasn't mm. the 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 event business like Again, hindsight is no sight, but it was the best thing that could have happened to Headspace, and it would have never have ever it would never be what mm. it is today if we hadn't done the events, because we basically had a a live R and D lab with two to four hundred people every single week that we mm. could speak to face to face. We could see their emotion, we could see what worked, and we had that every week, mm. and it was so invaluable. And we used to collect hundreds of these feedback cards, and we pour through them over the week. And that gave us all of the insight about what worked, what didn't. It started off as an eight-hour event. It went down to six hours, four yeah. hours, three yeah. hours, <laughs> and it all the way, all the way down Sounds to an bad. hour. Yeah. yeah. So, it, and it was getting yeah. shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. So, that that was a massive part of the of the pre-run. And the the truth was that the business was so bad that we'd run out of money, and it was literally like the last roll of the dice. Like mm -hmm. I'd like to tell you that it, I think it just got to a point where we were. We were getting so many requests from around the world yeah. for people saying, we can't come to your event, we'd love to get some content, and we were selling these like <laughs> tracks kind of over the, yeah. over the web. And then we thought, well, yeah. we, went to, we came to New York, we did an event, and someone said, have you ever thought about doing this as a subscription? We were like, no. And so we thought, let's do that. And it, I'd love to tell you it was more planned than that, but that was literally yeah. the genesis. And we, it, we had 50,000 bucks left, and we chucked it all on the subscription. Yeah. And, and the first January, it kind of, we launched it with a partnership with The Guardian, and it's basically been going up ever since. And it, it's not coincidence. I mean, anybody who's developing an app or starting a business, what we force you to do, or anyone who force you to do, is talk to customers and do customer yeah. discovery. So if you take feasibility here, that's what you're going to have to do. Everyone wants to build an app to solve a problem, but they haven't talked to the customer. They did that before they launched their app. I mean, they had sort of like face-to-face -face yeah. contact with comments 
for however long you ran the events business, and there's nothing yeah. more invaluable than that. I, I would, yeah, and you know, we, we were talking about it in a meeting with, oh, I had a product today, you know, after, you know, leaving the monastery, there was really kind of, if you think, sort of almost three years in the clinic, doing one-to-one, -one working, they were guinea pigs. I had no idea what would work outside of the monastery delivered in a different way, you know, and doing one-to-one -one and then meeting Rich, and then we had a couple of years of events. So we really kind of had almost five years of understanding directly from the, the customer, consumer, kind of what worked and, and what didn't. And what was, uh, what was version 1.0? You know, you said you, you took $50,000 uh, yeah. from friends and family and your money. Yeah. And, uh, and what, when did you launch and sort of what was the initial product? Well, the, the, the first product was how do we replicate what happens in the clinic mm. on an app? And it was a linear journey. So it was three, the idea was, at that point, the only time that you could get meditations was if you sent off for a CD and you got it sent to you and you, you kind of listened on repeat to the same track over and over again. Or you went to a Buddhist center or you went to a community center and went and learned it, learned it live. So it was actually, at that time, to do every single day a, a separate session. So it was 365 days and Andy was in the, so they, the black yeah. box recording it. Yeah, so, they, so we were in Soho in London and they, they locked me in a box for a year. And um, a bit like being back in a monastery. <laughs> so, and, um, and yeah, you know, I think, I don't know how long it took. Maybe it was like four months or something like that, five months. And, and we just, I just recorded kind of every single day over, you know, a year's worth of, of meditation. And I think this, we still have it yeah. and we may still use it. Um, I think that there was something about that journey. On the one hand, it was very limiting because um, once people, as I say, you know, once you're on it, you either continued or you kind of got off en route. But then people would kind of say, well, this is, this is great. I love it. But, you know, I don't want to wait until month six um, to learn about how to apply mindfulness to relationships. I'm in the middle of a breakup right now. And so it's kind of like, mm, okay, so we're going to have to kind of look at how we break this year down into a more kind of modular um, sort of program so that people could access what they want when they want. Best I said to Anna, I said, so what, what have you, do? how have you ended it? <laughs> like, because obviously you had to listen to all the content and I didn't listen to the, he said, well, um, I've just kind of said that, you know, when it gets to the end, like, thank you for using Headspace and, 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 and good luck. And I so like, <laughs> it was. It, it, I said, that's it, the worst it, subscription business ever. Yeah. It was genuine. I, yeah. I, you know, obviously I didn't have a lot of business experience. And um, so, so I, I really was. It was like, you know, thanks so much for, for being with me for the last 365 days. I hope you found it useful. And, um, oh. and um, yeah, you in, in, enjoy the rest of your, you know, your journey, whatever you do next. And, um, yeah, we very quickly realized that that, that wasn't a recipe for, for success or retention. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, you've graduated to level <laughs> yeah. two yeah, exactly. of 50 more levels. Yeah. Um, and so you initially grew your user base. You said you, you had a big push in the British newspaper. Yeah. Tell us how you used that sort of as a, as a marketing edge. Yeah, we had like two big partnerships early on that made a big difference. So we, we partnered with Virgin Atlantic when there was only like three of us. And we yeah. got the content on every single Virgin Atlantic plane. And then we approached The Guardian and we did a, a content swap where they, we created some bespoke content for all of their readers in January, which is their kind of new year, new you kind of s session. So 6th of January, 2012, we convinced them to put a million booklets on the front of, uh, so it's printed and it was 10 easy steps to meditate and it had an offer in it. And that was really, that's yeah. what kind of launched without yeah. those two partnerships, Headspace it's would just stopped. never have, never have happened. And they were, and they didn't cost us anything either. Mm. In fact, Virgin paid us. Um, but the, the Guardian one was completely just an exchange of content. Ugh. So always finding sort of partners that you can, yeah. you know, get you to a first customer. They weren't your customer, but they lead to customers yeah. and mm -hmm. sort of be a lead blocker for you in your market. In 2013, uh, you moved from the UK or from London to here. And, uh, you know, most companies that are tech-based companies would go to the Bay Area. Mm. Why did you decide LA was the right place for Headspace? Um, so I think there were, there were two, well, let's start with the, the easy one was that we love surfing and, um, we really wanted to surf and to wake up in a sunny climate where we could surf before work each day. That's the truth. Um, so now the professional answer, um, LA 
seem to be having a, a and this is this is genuine. Like L A was having a moment, and is having a moment. I think for us it was really exciting. We we would never have fit in in Silicon Valley. Um, I think this was much more aligned with the, not only our, our personal kind of lifestyle preferences, but also kind of where we wanted to take the, the product. LA is a really unique coming together of entertainment and creative and technology. And, and we see this as, a, like, when we started out trying to convince people to try meditation, mm. I mean, we would get laughed out of a room, you know. 10 years ago, people just weren't kind of open to that at all. And it was in creating an entertaining and in sort of engaging invitation to it that we found a route in. And so for us, this has always been about kind of entertaining content. And LA is the home of entertaining content. And it just so happens that technology now has found a home here as well, which allows the delivery of that content. Yeah, I mean, if you're telling stories, you want to be here. And yeah. uh, we sort of got access to media, entertainment, tech. Yeah. and. Uh, where do you guys do you guys live on the like South Bay, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, where I live, or where do you guys sort of surf? I'm in Venice. Yeah, I'm in Santa Monica. All right. yeah. And uh, you talked about your first uh, capital, which was fifty thousand uh, dollars. How much have you raised so far? From whom? <laughs> and how much have you spent? Yeah. Um, so we've raised about thirty-four million. Um, we did. Uh, we waited. If you think we launched in 2010 and we didn't do our Series A until September 2015, mm -hmm. so we bootstrapped it for a, a long, long time, and we were profitable when we did that round. Um, so we we were really lucky, and that's kind yeah. of been a an important. I think it was a really important decision for a socially mission-driven company to make sure that we had all the controls, all the the power in making the decisions that we wanted to to make in order to get this this project to where we've always dreamed it could it could get to. We chose uh, the Churning Group as the, the lead investor, mm -hmm. which is Peter Churning's kind of fund. Um, and we met, we met over 60 different investment vehicles, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, so we got to, it was a, a learning curve. I, I, we probably met too many people, is the, is the truth. Um, but we picked TCG because we really love Peter and the team. And I think they're point of view around digital media and, and content mm -hmm. I think is is really interesting for for what we're doing and they were local and so we spent a lot of, a lot more time with those guys and got to know them personally uh, and then there was a bunch of people so Jeff Weiner who you know LinkedIn uh, Jim Breyer who was first money in at, at Facebook back in the day um, like Ryan Seacrest Jessica Rao, a bunch of influencers um, Advance It Capital, which is Sherry Redstone's uh, fund. I mean, there's a there's a whole. It was a it was a laundry list of, of <laughs> interesting and smart people. Yeah. And uh, and how much have you spent of that 34 million that you raised? Virtually nothing. <laughs> Wait, you said nothing? Yeah, ver yeah, pretty much. We've still got. Yeah. We've pretty much got. Well, we have got all the money that we do we have. Yeah. Did, seriously. So you've got dry powder to grow, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, uh, when we did, to put that into context, we had 17 people when we did the deal in, in September 2015. We have over 175 now, and we've done a big office move. So we funded the business in, in a, a lot in that time, but the business is, is healthy on, on its own. Mm. You're funding it organically, right, through yeah. operations? Yeah. Through yeah. So subscriptions are, you know, unlike many uh, startups and newer apps, uh, you've got a revenue stream, yeah. there's money yeah. coming in, it pays for your employees, and the growth part is probably where you'll tap into this. So give us uh, a thumbnail sketch of, of where it stands now to the extent you want to share sure. you know, the, the number of subscribers and sort of growth. You mentioned how many people are working with the company now? How many? Uh, I have 170 now. All here, all, pretty much all here? And we've got three, we've just started an engineering hub in San Francisco, which we've got about three, three we've only just started that, and then we've got an office in London. Mm. It's got about 12 people. Of course you have an office in London. Yeah. 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 The, the original it's office. Yeah. Still is in London. And uh, so how many subscribers do you have now? And, and then give us, for those of us who are, for those of them who are not uh, on Headspace or subscribers, give us sort of the plans, the pricing plans and how it works and just an overview of the business model for the company. Yeah, sure. Um, so we don't really subscriber numbers, but I can tell you that we're just about to cross 14 million downloads. Um, and to put that into con some context, you know, 85% of that is still driven 
organically through kind of word of mouth and, and PR. So we don't do a, a huge amount of paid advertising. We do a bit, but mainly that is driven through the, the natural viral nature of the, of the product. Um, it's a subscription split between monthly, yearly, two yearly, and lifetime. Most of our subscribers are in the yearly bucket, um, followed, by, followed by monthly. Um, yeah. So uh, I imagine you have a, a dashboard on your computer that tells you a, a variety of things yeah. uh, on this business in terms of, uh, you know, why don't you share what are the things that you really tune into, whether it's uh, customer acquisition costs, which sounds fairly low because you're yeah. not doing marketing, it's word of mouth, which is the best thing when you have a viral loop, meaning, uh, uh, you know, Lauren sends me a membership or a code to sign up. I like it so much that, which is true, she did. Thank you very much. That's not. And then I tell somebody and three other people sign up. That's the dream. That's called the viral loop. What other things do you look at? Customer acquisition costs, retention, return rate, frequency, long-term value of the customer. What are you uniquely keened into or keyed into? Yeah, so I, LTV is a long-term, you know, lifetime value is an important measure for how you spend in terms of customer acquisition. So that's something that we track. Churn is obviously something that we track. It's really important Explain for Explain what that is. To be yeah, so you know, how many of your subscribers are churning when their monthly renewal comes up, when their yearly renewal comes up, their two year, obviously the <laughs> lifetime never, never churns. Um, so that's, an, that's a really important metric for a subscription business. Um, we also kind of obsess mainly about engagement mm. and different, t different buckets of engagement. So we think about that as uh, weekly kind of active meditators that's kind of we're not a kind of daily um kind of engagement we're not like a facebook or a snapchat that's not really the kind of engagement game that we're in uh, but it's always about how do we nudge mm. people from this the various buckets that we have um into higher levels of engagement so we kind of obsess about the cohorts and how we're pushing them through and <laughs> how we do that with different types of content you know we've been working a long time on a on a new version of the mm. update of the product which i think will you know, really dramatically improve the Headspace experience quite a lot. So what's your ideal, let's say ideal customer, the one that, you know, your strike zone of, of how often they engage, how, you know, <laughs> is there one? I mean, you've, you've got different buckets, but are there? Do you want to take that from a? Yeah, I mean, I think look, when we, when we started, our ideal um, kind of Headspace user was meditating every, every single day for at least 10 minutes a day. Um, and then reality kind of struck and it was like, okay, that's not how people, that's not how most people are gonna use it. Um, so it's really interesting to look, we've got three very distinct kind of buckets of, of users um, and they're, they're all equally kind of interesting and, and kind of valuable, you know, to, to the community. So um, the first, first part are kind of what we call aspirin users. So these are people who have Headspace on their phone. They don't use it every day. They wait until they get stressed or they wait until their exams kind of happen or I don't know, till a relationship breaks out or so something kind of just those the things that are going on all the time. And then they use Headspace to feel better. As soon as they feel better, they put it back down again. So it's kind of like the aspirin. Mm -hmm. Then there's kind of the, the vitamin type users um, who is a bit more preventative. Those guys are using it most days, at least five days a week. Um, it's quite a big cohort, um, but that they're, they're using it because they don't want to get to a point where they feel stressed and they feel unwell. And then there's kind of big life events. So people who, they have it on their phone, they don't use it every day until a certain something happens in their life. Maybe they got unwell, maybe someone in their family gets unwell, maybe somebody dies, maybe they're getting married. Like there are these really big life events and then we'll see kind of sustained usage for kind of three to six months, and then they might drop off again. And they won't come back until another big thing kind of happens in their life. So there's three kind of distinct kind of camps. And as a guru of this... I'm not a guru, uh, just to be uh, clear. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a, crack, a, a skilled expert. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting. He grouped um, um, illness, death, and marriage in the same group. Yeah, <laughs> my, my, my wife would feel so good about that. No, I, I think that, you know, and, and ha, as, as someone who, you, your dad? No. You have kids? Okay. So, um, I, I know someone joked earlier. Um, I, I think, um, look, as 
and, and anyone who has gone through um, kind of, uh, yeah, any, any of those things, like those big things, they don't have to be bad. They, good, big things in life can be, can be good, you know, maybe you move country, maybe you move job. Like, so they, they can be really positive things as well, but they have a big impact on our, on our life and they really kind of shake very often our sense of security. So, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, just I'm, being, be I'm being glib. But, oh, no. uh, <laughs> all of those things create a tremendous amount of just stress. Just in case my wife sees it at some stage. Yeah, yeah. you can look at it first. Um, we're going to open up to <laughs> questions for them in a minute. Um, if, if you want to you know, give an example of meditation, you're welcome to. I don't want to force you into anything. Well, it's... It's certainly not forcing me into anything. It's more I don't want to force anything on, on, on you guys. You know, if you guys would like to have a go, yeah. you know, I'd be, yeah? yeah. Okay. So, so for this bit, I, I know some of you have been taking notes. It's better if you don't take notes during the meditation. <laughs> um, it might interfere a little bit. If you've got, um, you probably already got your phones switched off or on silent. If you haven't, if you can just make sure that, that they are now. And I'm going to recommend as well that you um, just, you don't have to sit in any, any special way, but I would recommend that your arms and your legs are, are uncrossed. Um, you'll just find it kind of more comfortable to, to relax. Do you want the lights down? Or are you? Um, how, would, you like, would you like the lights down a bit more? Okay, let's take the, if we can take the lights down a little bit. I, I don't know if I'll... There's, oh, wow, that? that's really dark. Is it, everyone okay with that? Yeah, it's quite nice, actually. Okay. And then you don't have to look at me either. All right. So, to begin with, okay, just, just take a, a moment. If you've got anything on your, on your lap, if you're holding bits of paper or if you're holding drinks, I suggest you put them on the floor. I've seen lots of people spill their drinks as they fall asleep in the middle of meditation. So make sure that's all, all on the floor. So just take a moment just to make sure you're, you're sitting comfortably, your feet ideally flat on the floor. Don't worry too much if, if they're not. And the hands, the arms, you can just rest them on your legs or, or in your lap, whatever feels comfortable for, for you. And I'd like you to begin by looking directly ahead of yourself. So you're not focused on one particular point. It's almost like you're looking ahead, you can take in the entire space around you. So you can take in your peripheral vision, you can see either side of you, you can see above, and you can see below. So it's a very sort of soft focus that takes in the entire, entire space in front of you. And just maintaining that focus, I'd like you to take a couple of deep breaths, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As you breathe in, you're just focusing on the feeling of the lungs taking in fresh air, and as you breathe out, just noticing how the body sort of softens a little bit as you exhale. Just one more time, breathing in through the nose. And as you breathe out through the mouth this time, just gently closing the eyes. Okay. So in closing the eyes, we immediately become more aware of the other senses. So I want you to start by just noticing the feeling, the contact between the, the body and the, the chair beneath you. Just feeling the weight of the body pressing down. Just feeling the, the contact, the weight of the feet on the floor and of the hands and the arms just resting on the legs. I'd also like you to notice any sounds so very often we kind of think of sounds as something that are going to get in the way of a quiet mind. I'd like you to use the sounds. So just take a moment, a few seconds, just to notice all the different sounds around you. Don't worry if there's lots of thoughts in the mind. That's perfectly normal. And we'll build those into the meditation as we go. Right now, just bring the attention back to the body. So just noticing how the body feels this evening, whether there's a sense of heaviness or lightness in the body, sense of stillness or restlessness. And 
and then starting at the top of the head, just mentally, just scanning down through the body. Just noticing if there are any areas that feel particularly tense, tight, any areas that feel particularly relaxed. Just take 10, 20 seconds just to scan down through the body. Again, don't worry if thoughts come and distract you. Each time just coming back to the body as you scan down. So as you scan down through the body, some of you may have already noticed the feeling of the breath, a rising and falling sensation. So some people feel this in their stomach, for others it's in the chest, for some people the shoulders. If you can't feel any movement in the body, just gently place your hand on your stomach so you can feel that movement of the breath. So not breathing in any special way, but just following the natural rhythm of the breath. And as you do that, just starting to notice, are the breaths fast, are they slow? Are the breaths deep or are they shallow? And just to help you maintain your focus on the breath, I'd just like to count the breaths as they pass now. So just silently to yourself. As you feel the rising sensation, you count one. Falling sensation, two. Then three and four, just up to a count of 10. When you get to 10, you stop and start again at one. So just try that on your own. If at any point you get distracted, the moment you realize you're distracted, just letting go of the thought and just coming back to the breath again. Remember, we're not trying to stop thoughts, allow thoughts to come and go, but the moment you realize you've been distracted by those thoughts, just letting the thoughts go, coming back to the breath, and just continuing to follow that natural rhythm. Very gentle focus on the breath. And then just for a moment, I'd like you to let go of that focus, let go of any distraction. And just for 10 seconds or so, just let your mind do whatever it wants to do. So if the mind's been wanting to think, just let the mind think now. So nothing to do at all. just gently bringing the attention back to the body. Just coming back to that feeling of weight, the body pressing down against the seat, feet on the floor, hands on the legs. So 
So becoming more aware of your environment again, any sounds. And then when you feel ready, just gently opening the eyes again. And if when the lights go on, if we could just have sort of 25% rather than straight to 100%, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's straight to 100%. <laughs> so, sorry? It does feel good? Yeah, great. I'm happy to be here. Um, <laughs> I do, I, l I think there's, I have a couple of questions for you, if that's okay, before we do questions the other way around. Is that okay? Just like two, two minutes. Um, I do think there's something really interesting, and I just want to reassure, I, I hope most of you found it kind of pleasant and uh, useful. Um, but just to reassure, those of you that may have felt really kind of restless, or this is a skill. It's like any other skill. You kind of have to practice it. If you sat down at a piano, and after five minutes on the piano, it's like, no, this isn't really working. It doesn't play the tunes in my head. <laughs> well, yeah, you kind of have to keep going back and practicing. The same applies to, to meditation, to mindfulness, you know. So we have to keep coming back and practicing. So, and it, it's so different in a world where we are stimulated all of the time, where we are constantly kind of doing stuff. The first time, for a lot of people when they do this, it feels really alien, it feels really weird. It's like, what am I supposed to do? Well, that's kind of the point. There's nothing to do. But it takes the mind a little while to get comfortable with that idea. So we made that quite kind of short today. But we bought you, um, we bought you some codes so that you can get free access to the app. You can go away. You can have a go at this exercise and, and some of the other ones as well. Um, we'll give those, give those out at the end. But just one quick question. So how many of you feel different now, better or worse, than you did five, ten minutes ago? Okay, so kind of most of you, and hopefully not too many of you feel worse. Okay, so again, just to reassure, sometimes people say, oh, I feel really tired now. This, this meditation stuff makes me feel really tired. To be clear, meditation will never make you feel a certain way. It won't make you feel tired, but you may, in becoming more aware of your mind, you may realize just how tired you are. It will never make you sad. But it, you might realize, oh, actually, I didn't realize I felt sad or anxious. Or you might realize, I never knew how happy I was. So there's lots of different kind of outcomes. And it changes all the time. And it's just a, a continuous kind of journey. But I'd love you to just try that journey, you know, and just and see, how it, see how it works for you. So thank you for being game and joining, joining in. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, along with meditation becoming mainstream, sleep is also very much becoming a, a, a thing yeah. where people realize that it's very important. It's important the amount of sleep that you're getting. And so I'm wondering how do Buddhist monks feel about sleeping three to four hours a day yeah. and how that mm. affects their meditation and yeah. um, their falling asleep while meditating. Yeah. If there is any. Yeah, there's some falling asleep during meditation. Um, look, I, I think, uh, every, first, first thing to say, everybody, everyone's different, you know? So in this, in just in life, if you look around, some people have like a lot of energy and you look at them and it's like, how do you do all those things in a day, you know? And, they, and other people kind of a bit more kind of lethargic. And the same in the monastery, I used to look around the room and some people would be falling asleep continually and others seem to kind of be kind of sat there quite okay. I think... The mind is working very differently in the monastery. So we're not bombarded by, you know, all the stuff we're taking from the phones and from adverts and all the other kind of things that ordinarily are going on in our life. So the mind doesn't get as tired. So it just doesn't need as much, as much sleep. That said, after a year or so of like four hours a night, they call it retreat tiredness in the monastery. It's, you're a little tired. You'd kind of like to lie in, but at the same time, you're kind of fine. You're, you're okay to, to, to operate and to, to meditate effectively. It doesn't really influence the meditation too much. In fact, sometimes even being like a little bit tired, it, it kind of just brings our level of effort down a little bit and can be quite, 
quite relaxing, maybe even useful. Thank yeah. you. Hi, thanks for coming. That was awesome that Pleasure. we did that. Um, so most people, when they try meditation for the first time, they, like you mentioned, they do it for a certain amount of time and they drop it off. Yeah. Um, when you went to the Himalayas and, and became a monk, um, what made you continue through for five, ten years? Yeah. And, and also, second part of that question is, um, how do I know that I need meditation? Okay, um, let's do it the other way around. So um, I would just say, not just to yourself, but to, to everyone here, if, if there are times in your life where you sometimes feel stressed and you don't know how to let go of that stress, or if you sometimes struggle to go to sleep, or if you sometimes experience anxiety or sadness, or are overwhelmed by emotions or a busy mind, then you could probably benefit from, from meditation. I, I would recommend, as I say, trying it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, try it for yourself and see kind of how it how, how it feels um, in terms of the 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 other bit um, In order to go off and become a monk, I think you've got to be in a particular state of mind um, A state of mind which is fairly kind of okay I'm gonna do this, you know, because it meant kind of leaving university and family and, and all those things So I think I went through a whole range of different things. I went there thinking that uh, Nirvana was waiting for me um, it was quite a rude wake-up call um, when I was in the monastery and realized that, oh, wow, this is actually really hard. Yeah. And there's no distractions, there's no way of getting away from the mind, you know. Um, I think over time, kind of, uh, so to begin with, there's a bit of resistance towards it, you know. And um, maybe even like a, I needed a little bit of pride to kind of, my pride wouldn't let me leave, you know. Which was kind of a good thing in a way, because once you get kind of through that, then the mind starts to kind of settle down a little bit and you feel kind of a bit more at, at ease with it. And then the, the motivation changes. I think most people go away to do that kind of thing because they're looking for peace of mind for themselves. And I was definitely like that too. And then as you train as a monk or a nun, you're kind of encouraged to think about it, not so much what it can do for, for you as an individual, but how it kind of impacts others and how it impacts the wider world. So then the motivation changes. So you're not staying there because you have to stay there because you're trying to achieve something. Instead, it's like, okay, this is, this is a really positive thing to do for, for, for the wider world. And so then it becomes a, just a really joyful kind of thing to do instead. Yeah. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, I was wondering, with the increasing amount of meditation apps coming out, how do you guys keep up with the competition and remain the leaders in the... Yeah, go on. Um, it's, been, it's over 3,000 apps in the App Store to do yeah. with relaxation, meditation, like however way you, want, you want to call it. So it's pretty crowded space. Um, I think I think there's a lot of relaxation apps out there that kind of can show you waterfalls or sounds, or and they maybe give you a a brief respite. You know, it will relax you. I think. Because of the training that Andy's had, I think we try and put out a system of learning that is really kind of skill-based and gradual, and you feel like you're actually learning something that you can take away for yourself and apply to your life in a really skillful way, which I think is, is different to a lot of the, the kind of products that are out there. I think because we were so early on, yeah. you know, we were the, the first meditation app, we were the first subscription, um, you know, we've, back in 2012, you keep playing oh, yeah. on your phones everywhere. <laughs> I just hear like God coming down. Um, so I think we had we had a really good we had a really good head start. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. <laughs> we had a really good head start, um, which has kind of helped. And I think we've been. I think with the brand, the way that it looks, the I think the way that people talk about it. You know, the fact that Headspace made it onto Fallon the other day, and Andy was on Ellen, and I think those things are uh, they really help. Kind of keep you out mm. in front so i think the brand coupled with the the product experience and the the content keep us in front but we don't we don't pay too much attention to be honest to the to the competition we kind of keep an eye on it but we don't we don't kind of obsess about it mm. hey thank you so much for coming and i also want to say thank you for 
doing the work that you're doing. I think it's really important. Um, I've been meditating for about four years, and I kind of went from your aspirin type category to yeah. only recently in the vitamin type, and I found that's really where the benefits start. Um, and I'm wondering what your strategy is to help convert more of those aspirin type users to become full vitamin users. Yeah, I, it's a it's a continual kind of question in our in our product kind of meetings how we how we do that. I think there. Are, there are a number of different ways. I think part of it is driven inside the app and part of it is outside of the app. I think um, outside of the app and even outside of our what we're doing, there is just an increasing sense of permission within you know, society. So meditation is getting talked about a lot more. People are feeling more comfortable kind of taking it up and doing it. So that, that kind of stuff helps. But then inside the app, I think it's, it's looking at uh, or being a bit more realistic. So when I came back from the monastery, I kind of, the idea of doing less than an hour was kind of inconceivable. I didn't, I didn't know it worked like less than an hour, you know? So, and then I remember doing my first clinic session <laughs> and the people were only coming for an hour and I thought, well, this is going to be really awkward because they're just going to, they're going to pay some money and we're going to sit in silence and how's this going to work? And, and so I started kind of experimenting and can I move to half an hour and then to 15 minutes and to 10 minutes and then trying to find kind of like what's the sweet spot that kind of it feels like it has a meaningful um, benefit, um, but at the same time, it's kind of not too long for people. And I think what we're discovering in the app is, again, there's, there's different ways of kind of engaging, you know, and, and for some people, it might be actually coming along and doing two, three, four minutes a day. Like that might be for, for that person that I still consider that preventative. If they're coming along every day and not simply using it as, a, as an antidote, um, but there, there's continue that idea of intention you know is such an important thing in meditation just turning up each day doesn't kind of really matter kind of what happens or what's going on in your life just turning up each day and I worry less over time as to how long that's for whether someone turns up for three minutes or for five minutes I don't know do you want to yeah I, I think it's also um, being really realistic that for most people sitting with themselves every single day is really really difficult mm. And so I think there's just been a bit of an acceptance from on our part that not everyone's going to do that or want to do that. So we're actually just thinking about different types of content as well that aren't just meditation that we yeah. can start to surround the experience with that can help someone either motivate them to get to that point or actually we think that if you can start to change people's perspective about the way they think about their life and the way they think about health and happiness in its kind of broadest sense... Yeah then actually that's a, real, that's a really valuable thing. And at the moment, we've just got the kind of the pure meditation piece in there. But as we start to release this new product, you'll start to see lots of different types of content that can hopefully engage lots of different types of users. Hi there, thank you so much for coming to, to our class and speaking with us. Uh, in the introduction video, it mentioned how uh, when someone pays for a subscription, then Headspace goes ahead and matches that subscription yeah. for someone in need. And the app itself is already um, you know, helping to improve people's lives. So I was just wondering why you guys decided to add that aspect to it um, to make it so much better um, and sort of how it works and what role it plays in the business. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Do well, I think you have to tell you we started off as a non-profit actually when yeah. we first started and um and we just got laughed at is the truth I, yeah. i'd hate to like in, in the uk that's a it's not it's not a particularly well received thing i think it's very different in america actually yeah. but in the uk when you say oh we're a non-profit and we're, we're a meditation he used to be a monk and i used to be in people just to laugh at us and go yeah yeah see yeah. you later so um okay. so we changed that and actually when we started to charge for the service people took it you know, much more seriously is, is the yeah. truth. And I think Andy and I always had a um, bit of a Robin Hood kind of approach, which was if you can afford to pay for it, great. But if you can't afford to pay for it, which a lot of people can't, yeah. um, we wanted to make it available. Um, so we're doing, you know, we're working with about over 400 different non-profits and NGOs. We work with Oxfam. You know, we've given hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscriptions away for free. Yeah. Um, we just, yeah, we yeah. just hit over five million minute, minutes with with just with the nonprofit partners recently right. um, of of meditation use. So it's, and I don't know if you want to talk about anything else, but no, I just like I I think it's it just it, this is a primarily like first and foremost it's a socially you know it's a social mission <laughs> for us, 
And in order to deliver on the, the mission and the vision, it has to be commercially successful. But that doesn't mean that the social mission can't come first and foremost and can't be incorporated and integrated into every single part of what we do. And it's a really important thing for, for all of us, I think. When you look at some of the, you know, Rich mentioned Oxfam, it's Red Cross, MSF. Uh, these, are, these are NGOs in, in war zones, they're rape crisis centers, they're addiction centers. Uh, it's so kind of broad and when we get those mail, you know, emails and things kind of coming back from those places, it's such an important part of why we all turn up to work every day. Um, we can't think of a good reason not to, not to do it. Hi there, thank you so much for coming. Um, so you guys do a lot of work promoting mindfulness and meditation, um, specifically through people's phones and tablets, which tends to be an area where people actually tend to get distracted and taken out of the moment. So has that been a challenge for you guys? And if so, how have you dealt with it? It's not been so much of a challenge, actually. In fact, it's what's enabled us to do what we've done. Um, I actually, I think both of us, we, I think we both really enjoy kind of healthy tension, you know, like there's really interest, it's interesting that paradox, you know. Um, the, the phone and the tablet is not the, the problem, first and foremost, just to be absolutely clear. The, the phone is a piece of plastic, glass and metal. It's an inanimate object. It doesn't bother you, I promise you. Like your relationship with it, that's something else. That's between you and your phone. But the, the phone itself is just, you know, so... I, as Rich mentioned earlier, I think there's something far more interesting kind of thing. Rather than kind of saying, that, you know, phones or tablets, there's, a, there's an issue with them. It's kind of, okay, as entrepreneurs, like how can we find a, a way to use those in a, in a positive way? And the truth is everyone is on their phone and we wanted to meet people where they were rather than trying. It's hard enough, trust me, it's hard enough getting people engaged in meditation as it is. Um, never mind trying to pull them away from their phones as well. So to serve up meditation on their phones, that seemed for us like the, a really obvious kind of way to, way to go. Thank you again for being here. Um, this question is more for Andy. Um, I was wondering how the transition went from after your time of being a monk and leaving everything and then coming back to, I guess, like the real world and back to the other type of reality that's filled with the material life and everything, how you kind of dealt with that. Yeah, I was thinking of that as I sat in my Lamborghini the other day. No, I wasn't. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> no. Um, no um, he doesn't have a Lamborghini. Just to be clear, yeah. he doesn't have a Lamborghini. <laughs> no, I, I think it was, it was, um, <laughs> It was, it was eased for me a little bit, you know, like I said, I, I was sent from the, the monastery to, to Moscow in, in Russia to teach meditation in a, so I was living as a, as a monk, towards the end of my time as a monk, I was living as a monk, but in a city, uh, which was really kind of interesting, you know, because you're trying to kind of live the, the vows and the rules of kind of a monastery, but living in a city. Um, but what it did, I, the challenges aside, um, and I mean, any, anyone from Russia here? Anyone from, no? Um, I mean, yeah. Um, I, you know, the, there were some challenges, some very real challenges, and I, I didn't find people were always particularly receptive to a bold guy in a skirt walking down the street. Um, th those things aside, it enabled me to be part of everyday life, but living, living as a monk, you know, so I was still, I didn't like the idea of, the local community who were really kind of hard up at the time, which was like some time ago. Um, so I actually started working in a local school during the day and teaching meditation in the evening at night. So I was, I was kind of, I was going to work, um, but dressed as a, dressed as a monk. Um, and I was earning some money to pay for the flat. And then I was going into the meditation center and teaching. So I, I feel like I had quite a nice transition. Probably the harder transition is coming out of, out of retreat. Uh, so if you spend kind of a year or two like completely away from everything with no contact with the outside world, uh, when you leave there, it's quite, it's quite a shock, you know, uh, especially if you've been in silence kind of a, a lot. Um, I was joking with some of the guys from work the other day. Um, one, uh, one of my teachers, he had a group of, uh, a group of guys doing a, in Tibet, it's very common to do a three-year, three, so it's a retreat. And you're completely locked away for the whole time for three years, three months, three weeks, and three days. And these guys had just come to the end of it. 
And they were, it, this was in a Tibetan monastery in Scotland. And he went and picked them up from the, from the retreat. And um, he said, I've got a treat for you. We're, we're going to drive, rather than go back to the monastery, we're going to drive down into town. And he took them to see Jurassic Park. <laughs> and and <laughs> we had these, these 15 guys who had been in complete seclusion for three years, walking into the cinema, like watching these massive dinosaurs, not really sure whether it was real or were they watching, like was it in their mind? And so, um, yeah, I, I think it can be a shock. That's quite an extreme version. Um, but but my, own, my own experience was that actually, you know, the mi mind is mind. And whether the mind is in the reality of a Himalayan monastery or it's here, uh, mind goes with you wherever it is. It's not a different, it's not a different mind. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I want to thank you once again for coming out here and talking to us. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I have two quick questions. So the first one is, you know, as someone who listens to podcasts a lot, I know you guys sponsor a bunch of really great podcasts like Tim Ferriss' um, podcast himself. But I'm wondering, how come you guys haven't actually possibly looked into the, to the you know, the arena of podcasts and maybe even uh, starting a podcast for yourself and, you know, about meditation and maybe not even limiting it to meditation? It's coming. <laughs> and then my second question is for Andy. So, <laughs> uh, so recently I listened to the other podcast, How I Built This, which is an absolutely amazing podcast. And you, I would recommend that you guys go on there because a lot of people would be intrigued by your journey. But uh, I was listening to Manoj Bhargava, and he's the, he's the founder of Five Hour Energy. And he had a very similar journey to Andy's. And, you know, he dropped out of Princeton went to India for seven years to pretty much be a monk. Um, when he came back, he said he was able to exercise a lot of simplicity and common sense in his life. So do you, do you feel like you, you were able to um, go along that pathway as well? Yeah, I, I, look, I think inevitably you, you can't live that, that life and not bring a degree of simplicity kind of back. I think it, that's one of the beautiful things about it is that it just strips away all the, the clutter, whether it's internal clutter or external clutter. Um, I found kind of um, as in starting, in starting a, and growing um, a business and in, in getting married and having children, um, I have less simplicity in my life um, than perhaps I did when I was a monk, but I, I, it's a very enjoyable complexity. Um, I'm very fortunate you know, in, in what I do. But I, look, I, I think, bottom line, if, if you meditate on a regular basis, there, there is a freshness and a simplicity um, to, whatever, to whatever you're doing in life. Yeah. Oh, just uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my question is more geared toward like, the value add you know, aspect of your business. So I want to know if it's once you reach like a certain um, mastery. So does that stop? Do you, do, as a customer, do I just like stop learning if I master the meditation um, aspect? And I, so what is kind of the value there afterwards? Like, I mean, is there levels to it? And then from what it seems like, there is maybe like a beginner, intermediate, and then there's the advanced. And then once you get advanced, you're kind of, you know, done yeah. pretty much. You're on your own afterwards. So does that you know, uh, customer engagement like continues on or like does it end there and then you, you know, go on to for new customers? That's you. Now you go. Okay. So, I mean, so first and foremost, that there's not an, an enlightenment pack. It's not like <laughs> you, you, you go up the levels and then it's like, oh, okay, I'm done now. Um, my experience, I'm still learning. I'm absolutely, I, I get called all kinds of things. Um, some of them are uh, nice, some probably not so nice. But, um, you know, I consider myself a, a student of mindfulness, certainly not a mindfulness kind of expert, you know. Um, and I figure if I'm still learning now, after 10 years of study away and probably, I don't know, 30 odd years of meditation, you know, um, then there is always, you know, the, it is a lifelong journey. It's the same as any other skill. I don't, you know, you look in, in I, I'll use professional sports as an example. If you look around professional sports, you never hear of anybody, even at an elite, at an Olympic level, kind of saying, yeah, I'm done. Like, I've, I've gone as far as I can go. Or, like, you know, there, there is always kind of more to, to learn, whether it's in art and music and sport or whatever it might be. Um, and the same is, is true in meditation. And that's something we kind of try and bring into the, into the app as well, 
is we want to be kind of a companion. We want to be a, a guide for people throughout their life and a backstop no matter what's happening in their life at any time. It may be that they're not always a subscriber and that's fine, but maybe it's that they come back to us kind of when difficult things do happen. But knowing that there is a, a, a friendly kind of guide or companion that can help them through difficult situations as well as for those people interested in the more preventative approach or even kind of an existential kind of approach that there's something kind of there. I think that's how we try to try to approach it. There's also no community in the current product. Yeah. So, and I think as you start to see the product change, there will be a lot more of that. And I think that will become a, you know, when we talk about the viral effect of the product, it's literally word of mouth. Like there are no traditional viral loops in the product. There's mm. no sharing mechanic in the product. There's no community in the product. So mm. when we talk, it's been, it's grown like that. It's literally people going, have you tried Headspace? You should download it. <laughs> so once we actually start to build those loops into it, I think the experience for a user will be, will be pretty different. Mm. Um, and I think that's what hopefully will keep you engaged and motivated and part of a group. Imagine if all of you guys could be on a, in a group together. You knew at a certain time you could all meditate, check in. All of those kind of things, I think, can really help kind of make it feel like a different experience. Hmm. You talked about how in the early days um, with the feedback cards, data would inform um, and even change your content. And I'm curious how now and today, how data informs your content, because it seems like whenever I'm using the app and my mind starts to wander, you're always telling me to bring it right back, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's a practice kind of yeah. question there, but there's also a, a date. Do you want to take the data I one? I can take the data one. So, you know, we, we built everything until about a year ago purely from instinct, is the truth. Everything <laughs> was purely instinct, no data at all. Um, we hired a, uh, our head of product from, from Zynga and ex Amazon, so we've got pretty good at data recently. Um, and I think we're, we always like to be data informed, but not purely data led. And I think there's, there's, there is different, I think certain companies make all decisions based on data. I think we definitely try and walk that, that line about what is the, ex what does the experience feel like? Like we obsess about that. Like that's, that's the thing that we probably, as a team, we think about the most. And then it's how do you layer in data to, to kind of, I think as you get different people in the team that where their brains work in different ways and they, they, uh, they approach problems in different ways, you have to have different ways of putting that argument forward. So data is really important for parts of the org, not so important for others. Mm -hmm. And so it's always that blend of creative skills and engagement and feel with data, so we try and walk that line, but I don't think we've we've fully nailed it yet. Would be my no. would be my take. And on the practice bit, as human beings, we're all remarkably alike. You know, <laughs> that the mind is is naturally. But you'd be amazed, like the amount of people that come up and say, "How do you know my mind's wandering at that moment?" <laughs> Clearly, I don't, but I can have a pretty good guess. You know. So I saw a Facebook video of young kids in the UK talking about how they're incorporating meditation after playtime, and I thought it was the cutest thing. Um, and they talked about how useful it was to them. I'm curious what you think the role of meditation could be in a young child's life as they're growing. Nice. Yeah, you, go, you okay. can. You can sure. Well. Okay. Yeah, I think. Um, look, I. I think it, it. I think it's invaluable. Um, there's a there's a quote. I don't know if you saw it by it by the Dalai Lama, who kind of said that that if every every child kind of learnt uh, learnt meditation before the age of eight, that in a generation there would be no war. I think that's. Look, I think that's quite ambitious. It's quite a big kind of I idea. But I do think there's something really interesting at at the personal level. I think again. Uh, giving children the tools and skills they need to grow up ha happy and healthy. Number number one. I think secondly, it's it's thinking about kind of in terms of um, direct relationships. So, growing up with a sense of respect and kindness to those people around them. So, hopefully, kind of less, you know, bullying and less kind of that stuff going on as as they're growing up. And then, kind of, I think about it as a kind of wider sort of community as well. There's there's no doubt that. You know, I, I looked on the, Rich sent me a screenshot the other day um, in the morning. Um, there were 90,000 
headspaces all meditating at the same time. And then in the middle of the morning, someone sent me another one. Again, it was 90,000. And again in the afternoon. And it was kind of like thinking like, wow, at any one time, that many people kind of sitting down, letting go of all their opinions and beliefs, the things that divide us, and actually being present in the world with a sense of positive intention, I think that's incredibly powerful. And if we give kids the skills they need to do that, then we're looking at generations, instead of kind of divisiveness, hopefully of uh, sort of, yeah, slightly more harmonious instead. And I think just to add to that, I don't, our mission is how do we improve the health and happiness of the world? I don't think you can do that unless you can teach kids to do it. Yeah. And we had a brilliant story the other day, and I think this is that ripple effect thing, and it can come from anywhere, where a 10-year-old wrote in to say that they'd been using the product, and he was getting bullied at school, and he was, he was using it to kind of, to help him. And his mum noticed that he was using it, and then his dad noticed that he was using it, and someone else in his family noticed it. So from that kid, that 10-year-old that got recommended it from a teacher, it had spread through his family, all the adults in his family. Mm. So I think you never know when that seed can kind of... And I, I think to see it, in ch like when Andy teaches it with children, it's amazing to see because they don't have any of the hang-ups that we have. They just get it. You don't have to do the preamble. You just give them the exercise and they just do it mm. and they go and you're like how was that and they're like yeah my, it feels really nice it's kind of they, they don't they don't complicate it mm. so you think and i think if, if all of you think about what it was like growing up as a teenager and thinking i wish i didn't have to go through all that angst like, i wish i'd had something to kind of deal with some of that angst as a teenager i know i would have yeah, i would have loved it so if, if you think yeah. that that can become a core cool skill where you don't even think it's this extra thing that you're doing it's just part of the way that you live Mm. and you do that at scale, I mean, that's probably the most exciting thing that we could do, I think. Yeah. I wanted to add, can I ask you guys for like one extra minute or two extra minutes? Uh, that's, probably should just take that and, and finish <coughs> on that, but you guys started as, as friends first before you got into business. Is this on by any chance? Did you turn it on? And uh, so you, you started as friends, you guys have been through a lot. Um, and sometimes in business people say, don't go into business with your family, don't go into business with your friends. Um, and sort of connecting with, with Glenn's class about like, and you referred to this, like it, it's not just likely to happen that we're gonna encounter grief and loss and illness, it's a certainty. And so part of this is maybe it gives you a different perspective of that. Um, and, and, and forgive me if this is too personal, but you know, a couple weeks after you guys, after you moved to LA, yeah. you confronted a really harsh situation and health. So talk about what you guys have been through as friends and sort of yeah. how they gave you perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, we've been through, we've been through a, lot. A, a lot, and um, it's a real bromance, you know? <laughs> um, we gen genuinely, like, we, we've been through, uh, I, I wouldn't do it without Rich, and, and I know he wouldn't do it, you know, we've talked about it a lot, he wouldn't do it without me. Like, we are first and foremost kind of friends, we, we hang out together, we surf together, we go on holiday together, and we work together. Like, you know, it's not just uh, a, a He's working... He's also best man at my wedding later in the I, I am. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's... it's uh, I told you, it's a bromance, right? It's, um, so, I, you know, yeah, it, it goes... And, and when, yeah, when we came to LA, as you said, I, I had cancer, and, and Richie, you know, when you work, when you're growing a company, like something like that can be really kind of disruptive and a bit inconvenient. And Richie really kind of stepped up to, to the plate. And I mean, he was flying, all, I had so many talks and things booked in around the world and Rich was basically, he was just taking everything and flying around and kind of, he, you know, and I think it's really important that you know, kind of in a relationship like that, that you got each other's back and it doesn't matter what happens, the other person is always there to, yeah. to support. I would, and I think it's, like we've never actually had, a, uh, I know it sounds ridiculous and you won't believe it, but we've never, we've never had an argument. Mm. He did used to be a monk, to be fair, but... <laughs> the, the, uh, and, so, and you're both British. Yeah, and we're both British, and we're very true. polite. And it's we all very everything. repressed. Yeah. But I think it's, we've always, mm. it's interesting, we did a, we did a management offsite and they did the, the Myers-Briggs and we were like exactly the same, both yeah. idealists, both, like we were we, like, virtually the same all the same we picked yeah, out yeah. the same passages in this book that related most to us I, so i think we've and i think sometimes the team have found that difficult when you have a couple of co-founders it's like do i go to mum? do i go to dad like mom, you could call me mum. <laughs> <laughs> but we have never been no one's ever been able to get a different answer out of 
each of us. And that's actually that that when you're really solid like that and the team yeah. know it and that know that you're completely aligned. I think it has something kind of special to it. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's an unusual relationship, but one that, you know, it's been the best, it's been the mm. best, best thing that's ever happened. So it's been well, great. We've heard that from a few people when you sort of share one mind and you really sort of feel like you have the uh. same values and the same uh, mission <coughs> and vision. Um, it's been really a thrill to have you guys here. Thank you so much. Thanks Please for having us. Andy. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.